Lord, I just want to thank you this morning. God in heaven, who created all earth, whose name is honorable above all names, whose kingdom will come again. God, you've made things so perfect for us here and in heaven. And while we're here, we will face trials, God. As we face those trials and overcome those things, Lord, may your character be built in us so that we will be suitable to live in your kingdom. And we'll give you the praise for it in Christ's name. Amen. So, most of us have heard the Lord's Prayer. And we're starting in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13 this morning. How many of y'all have your word with you? If you have your word, would you hold it up? This is the word of God, right? Happens to be written to me, dear Jean, in the beginning. I know each of yours says, dear, in your name too, right? It's written for each of us. In Matthew, and again in Luke, actually, Luke has a shorter version of the, of the Lord's Prayer. We won't take the time to go over both of them, but they're essentially the same. One's a little shorter than the other. Jesus had been praying, and when he didn't finish praying, his disciples came to him. And they asked, God, teach us how to pray. And this is where this comes from. This was a model prayer that Jesus spoke to his disciples in teaching them how to pray. The, the prayer itself is extremely simple. So that a child can understand it. But at the same time, some of the greatest thinkers can't get their mind around it. They're dumbfounded by it. So let's, let's say that prayer real quick. Just read it, if you will. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts as we forgive those our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from e the evil one. And then many verses, <coughs> excuse me, many versions have this addition for thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. Right? Some don't have that on the end of it. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me for just a minute there. Christ's instruction is so simple. He said, when you pray, pray like this. But the very first thing that he does is say what? Our Father in heaven. Now, he doesn't say, my Father, does he? He's inclusive to all of us in this model. He says, our Father, who art in heaven, and identifies them as being located where? In heaven. So if our Father is in heaven, he's telling us right there, you've got a Father who's in heaven who loves you. Who cares about you? In fact, who cares about a relationship with you so much that he sent Christ? Now, when we start trying to get our head around that, we start trying to think about there's a God in heaven. Now, all we've seen is what? Earth. 
and listen, God made some really pretty stuff down here. Some really fantastic landscapes. Some really terrific things. Some beautiful things. Here. But this ain't heaven. So can we even get our heads around, other than the instruction that was given in Revelation, about what it's going to be like in heaven? Except for what the Lord, the, the Word has told us about heaven, how big it was, and that Christ told us there are many mansions there, right? It's kind of hard for us to get a clear picture of what it's going to be like. So we know what we see here. But Christ is talking about our Father and where he is is in heaven. And then he goes on to say, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed is just another way of saying holy, holy, holy. It's a way of honoring God's name. It's like saying, "On I honor your name. Right? And then he gets into your kingdom come, your kingdom come, your will be done. Right? On earth as it is in heaven. He says, give us today, not tomorrow. Give us today, not next week. Give us today, not next month. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, or some say debts, right? As we forgive those who trespass against us. And, and what he's saying here is not, and forgive us of our trespasses only after, right? So it's as we forgive others. We're going to unpack that in a minute. So says, lead us in temptation. God doesn't lead us in temptation, but he does test us. Okay, so maybe testing would be a better translation than temptation. But God allows us to be tested. <clears throat> Just think about that for a minute. And then deliver us from the evil one. Now again, some versions say, for thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever and ever. Okay? Now what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to make sure that I catch all the real important notes because I didn't have trans time to translate everything from this book over to my other notes. So let me turn to the first page here of my notes. It says three teaspoons sugar, ten... Oh, that's, like, that's Tammy's uh, water, water bread mixture <coughs> on the first page. I think I got the wrong notepad. And Tammy's like, that's where that went. So we think about the model prayer, and it is a model. It's broken down into two parts. The first part has three petitions. Okay, when we think about it. It is, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Those are the three petitions. And you note the first half of the prayer is all about God, isn't it? Nowhere in that, in that petition cycle there, nowhere in the first part of that prayer does it say, God, I want a new sports car, shiny red, convertible, 650 horsepower, seven speed on the floor. Does it? No. Nowhere on there does it say, Lord, send me five million dollars quickly. No. Doesn't say that either. But the petitions are, honor be to your name. Please bring your kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, right? These are the petitions in the prayer. And if you look at Christ's other prayers, such as when he was in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying, he says, Lord, if it's your will, let this cup pass from me. <clears throat> now, what cup was he talking about? He was talking about the crucifixion, right? If it's your will, let this cup pass from me. But never 
nevertheless, your will be done, not mine. So you can see that Christ himself in prayer used a similar model. So if it's possible, let the cup pass, but nevertheless, your will be done. And this is here. Holy is your name, my Father in heaven, right? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. The third, first three things in, in that prayer is all about God. A key thought starts with our Father, and then the three first focal points are all about Him. So as we pray, Christ is telling us, concentrate on God, His holiness. Right? When we say, hallowed is thy name, what are we saying? Are we saying, God, I want to honor your name. If your name is hallowed, I want to honor it. How am I going to honor it? Am I going to honor it with what comes out of my mouth? Am I going to honor it with my actions? Or am I going to dishonor it? This is not just lip service here. Objectively, it's to get us thinking. Hallowed be thy name. If my focus is on the things of God when I pray, my focus is leading toward honoring God in what I say and what I do and the things in my life. If we're, if we're seeking God's kingdom first and to honor him first in our lives, do you think our relationships would be better? Sure, things start falling into place, don't they? If we're honoring God the way that he's asked us to and the way that he modeled for us right here in the prayer, seek first the kingdom of God, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and the things of God, and all other things will line up for you. And in this model prayer, he's telling us, hallowed be thy name. Holy, holy, holy is the name of God. Honor to you, God, in what I say. Honor to you, God, in what I do. Honor to you, God, in my life. First foremost honor to you it's kind of a difficult concept for a lot of people because uh, folks just don't honor God now, some will even cite this prayer and it's lip service it's not intended for lip service. It's intended to, to lay out for us a lifestyle. Hallowed be thy name. The first thing, God, Father in heaven, hallowed, holy, holy, holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, not mine. We, we tend to have a lot of hard time getting ourselves out of the way sometimes. The structure of God's prayer deals first with God and then humanity. God says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your faculty, right? First. This is exactly lining up with the word. When you think about this prayer right here. He says go after the things of God first, doesn't he? It, throughout his word we see that. And when Christ gives them this model prayer, what does it do? It tells us the very same thing. It tells us the very same thing. And when we reach into it just a little bit. When we study the word and it starts coming alive to us. When God's given his proper place in our lives, from start to finish, 
Everything else lines up. Now, does it mean you won't be tempted? No. It doesn't mean you won't be tempted. God allows for temptation to occur. But it doesn't mean that you won't be tempted. God's not going to lead us to temptations. But ourselves will stray enough to where we'll be cast into those areas. And we'll unpack that just in a little bit. But James tells us very clearly God doesn't lead us there. And he can't be tempted. God's given his supreme place, and that's what God's telling us to do in his word. Give God. Understand where God is and who he is, and then give him his supreme place. Worship God. We want his kingdom and the things of his kingdom to come and be done on earth. He's saying, establish my kingdom in your household. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Now, that's establishing kingdomship, isn't it? If we can establish God's kingdomship right here, inside, right? Our mind, our soul, right? Get it all lined up to God the way that it's supposed to be and establish his kingdom in us. Will our will be in the way? Nope, I don't think so. Not only will we praise him, not only will we honor his name in all that we say and all that we do, but we will have established his kingdom right here in our own self. We'll be one with the Lord, won't we? And the Lord will be with us. And when that happens, his kingdom's established within us. So here now we've got we're honoring his name, and we've allowed his kingdom to come and be established within our lives, in what we say, in what we do, in how we treat others. It's going deeper than you thought, isn't it? Because, you know, in the past, you know, I've read this. And I've pulled some of that out of there. But until you do a deep dive sometimes in study of God's word, you don't get the full benefit of what God's really trying to tell us. And he's trying to tell us, even through this simple prayer, honor God. Make his place in your life, number one. Allow the kingdom to be established in your heart, in your life. When God's glory and honor are first, that's when we can be most effective, right? Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father, can you believe that? Our Father, a holy being in heaven who loves us and has done so much for us. He said, in my mansion are many many." mansions or many places many houses got one with my name on it this one down here is temporal that one up there is permanent Isaiah chapter 63 16 says if some of y'all like to turn there it says 63 uh, 16 looking at the fatherhood of God, says, Doubtless thou art our father, through Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer, thy name is everlasting. And in Psalms 103, 13 and 14 says, like as a father pitcheth his children, or pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knows our frame. He knows that we're dust. He knows where we came from. He actually formed us from what? The dust. Example after example after example in the word that demonstrates God 
Father, heaven. Right? Example of his holiness in the word. I don't think there's any argument there. Because Jesus teaches that God loves us. He's our Father. Imagine that. Son of man comes from the Father and then gives himself to us as a sacrifice so that we might have relation with him. Imagine the love that takes. Reoccurring theme is the word of God is God himself. The love of God is God himself. His character is what he wants us to allow in us. And the trials of this life help build character. It helped build the character of God in us, if we allow it, so that we'll be fit for the next section of our lives, which is with him. Because if we're not fit to be in heaven, are we going to get there? No, and we'll choose it ourselves. I'm trying to keep up with my notes here. They're smaller, so probably should have brought me a magnifying glass. I'm going to skip some of these because it's going to keep us here all day. But when we think about God's will being done, how do we know what God's will is? You know, a lot of times people say, oh, you know, I prayed and for that nice new sports car. And, oh, I knew it was God's will because uh, I had the money to go get it. Well, really, was it God's will or was it just your own? So how do, how do we know what God's will is? Perhaps if we could do without it, and we learn to do without it, and God still makes things happen, and we don't care that we got it. It's, in other words, I don't have to have the car. It's something I like, but I'm just going to do without it. But then it shows up on my doorstep. Maybe it is God's will. Because if I'm not paying for it and it just shows up on my doorstep and it's mine, it, it's going to have to be God's will. <laughs> that or I'll be arrested for it, right? <laughs> if we, can, we need to do, learn to do without things that we think are God's will sometimes. God, can I live without that? Yeah, you can live without that. God, I'd sure like to have it. If you don't get to go buy it signal, maybe it's not God's will. <laughs> if you don't have the cash for it, maybe it's not God's will that you go into further debt. Oh, my wife's directing me back over to the podium. Apparently, I'm out of screenshot. Technical difficulty. <laughs> so back on point. Sometimes it's a still small voice in our spirit. God ministering to us, the Holy Spirit touching us. But if we follow this track, we praise God, your kingdom come, your kingdom in us, your will be done. If we're following that track, we'll know what God's will is. If we put God first and we glorify his name, we're looking for his kingdom establishment right here within us. And his will is more important than our own, if his will is more important than our own, and we're doing without the things that we want, and we're following what he wants, then if you get that little sports car, then I guess it would be his will. But the other things have to be in place. I always have to doubt if that little red sports car was mine, right? Not today. I don't guess I'm getting one today. But I'll be looking for one if the Lord wants to send it. Hey. I'll take it. Corvette, please. Red. What is it? Uh, not a T-top, but the convertible. Yeah, that one. <laughs> My wife says, move on. She don't want me to have that car anyway. <laughs> the second part of that prayer in the model 
it's geared toward what humans' needs are. We said the first part was all about God, right? The second three petitions are daily bread, forgive as we forgive, and lead us not to temptation. Those are human needs as opposed to the godly needs. Curse, I'm going to have to pull one that you do. I'm going to have to find my place in my notes to make sure I catch everything. Can we have one of those intermissions? Somebody do the ding, 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 ding. Okay. I'll move on. My wife's saying move on. So I just got to get to the point where I catch up to my notes with what's up here. Just give me a minute because I didn't translate them over onto the big sheet. Just got to get to where it says second three petitions. All right. Give us this day our daily bread. As we said, today it says, give us our daily bread. Now, what God's trying to tell us here is count on him daily for our sustenance. Daily for our needs, right? Are we doing that? Are we counting on God for our needs daily? Are we exercising that muscle? I know we go to the gym, we do all this, right? You throw, you guys got these big old guns and shoulders and everything, big packs. They, they're, they're so big they can hardly move. Have you ever seen somebody so big? That, and they're exercising all those muscles. One of the real important muscles right here, are we exercising faith in God? Faith in his ability to provide for us. Right? Are we exercising that muscle? With Israel, did the manna fall weekly or was it daily? It was daily. Think about that. We're talking a couple thousand years later. Christ says, give us our daily bread. And he's telling us, count on God daily. What was Israel doing except for one day a week? They were collecting enough for them to eat for that day and that day alone. With the exception of the one day a week where they collected enough for both days. The Sabbath, right? That's the examples of provision. God sent ravens to feed Elisha, didn't he? Was that God's provision? Sure it was. Sure it was. What about the story where God multiplied the oil and meal for the widow? What was her name? A Zarephat? Who gave to, to a prophet to eat. And she's saying, I don't have, we're fixing to make our last meal and then die because we're going to starve. What did the prophet say? Make it for me. You'll be all right. We'll take care of you. And then the oil didn't run out, nor did the meal. God's provision, daily provision. Jesus fed how many people with two loaves and some fish? You see, the reoccurring theme is God's provision. How many have actually exercised that muscle? All right, God, I have faith enough daily for your provision. Exercising the muscle. Okay. So what about times of if we're, if we're now, if we're, we're kind of exercising that muscle, what happens if there comes a time of desperation in our lives? Oh, I keep getting sick. Come back over here. Desperation in our lives causes us to do what? Count on God, maybe? Exercise the muscle? What happens is the muscle's weak and flabby at that time. What happens if there's no strength in that muscle right about the time you need it? 
What happens if your faith is, faith is really weak when you need it the most? In a devastating circumstance. And trust me, the potential for devastating circumstances on the horizon at any given moment. Especially these days. And we need to have a muscle that works. That muscle happens to be our faith muscle. Are we exercising it? Little things in life that come along that, that cause us a little bit of stress reveal character in our lives. Right? You ever get into a tough situation, just all heck breaks loose. And there's a couple people that they seem to remain calm. They're just looking around, trying to figure out what's coming next. Maybe praying a little bit under their breath. Everybody else is flaking out. Hysteria. A couple of these old folks say, well, there'll be a plan coming. It reveals character when we're put under stresses. And a lot of times, unfortunately for us, it reveals character flaws. Like, maybe we haven't exercised that muscle. And when we need some heavy lifting... Ain't nobody around to help. Right? Folks, God is saying, I give you the ability to exercise faith. I want you to do it daily. Give us our daily bread. Pray for substance. Pray for things daily. Pray for your needs daily. When your money runs out before you're weak, pray for things daily. How many of y'all know that God can kind of stretch things out a little bit, make things work better? And if we've exercised the faith in our lives, if we've exercised the muscle of faith, if we put God first, if we glorify his name first, if we've put the things of God first and everything else kind of lines up, we won't see so many character flaws when all things break loose. When things just go, and it's a mess. We won't be able to see the character flaws. Because how many of y'all know, and I've been guilty of this, there's been times in life when things get hectic, and all of a sudden... Character flaws are highlighted. Like somebody put a flashlight on it, drew a big circle around it, drew a star above it, drew arrows around it, colored it in with bright pink highlighter. Character flaws are clear at that point. Think about that. God says we allow for things to happen to you get cooked a little bit once in a while to be refined. We let the temperature get turned up. That idea is to refine us. Men and women of God, to be refined and to work out those character flaws. And when we see them, what should we do about them? Oh, God, I didn't know that was there. I didn't realize that character flaw was so deeply embedded in my character. God, deliver me from that. Right? Forgive as we forgive. Forgive us as we forgive is the next part of that. Why didn't he say forgive if we forgive? Instead of as. 
Because that key word, forgive, as we forgive, is an attitude. Yeah, I know. Some people need a little attitudinal adjustment sometimes, right? We're not supposed to be the ones to to give it. (laughs) Although sometimes we want to feel like we should. Some of these old tough guys be out there, I got a little attitude adjustment for you. Right? Well, that should be God's business. Right? Not us to take a big stick and whack it out of them. He said, forgive, forgive us as we forgive others. In some uh, translations, it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors or people who are indebted to us. In Ephesians 4.32, God says, and that's, again, Ephesians 4, 3, 2. Be kind and compassionate one to another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. Right? In following God's example, in the, in the fifth, in Ephesians 5, it says, Following God's example, therefore, as we dearly, lo- as dearly love children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So we recognize that, right? We recognize our failure to forgive. Do you understand that failures to forgive cause scars? Do you understand that those scars are like poison to your system? If you don't forgive? Do you think that would be a character flaw deeply in your character if you failed to forgive? Because we already know if you don't forgive, God's not going to forgive you. He says forgive us as we forgive others. He says be quick to forgive and have compassion for one another. Bitterness, resentment. Boy, that, that's terrible. If we fail to forgive, bitterness and resentment will, deep, will be deeply seated in our, in our spirit man, right? You'll never get peace if you don't forgive. So that's that other petition. Forgive us, God, as we forgive. And he tells us plenty of times in the way. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Have compassion. Love one another. Is it possible to love one another if we don't forgive one another? I don't think clearly it can be. Right? Now here we said toward the end, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, James 1 and 13 Let's be clear that God cannot be tempted by evil. Nor does God tempt us with evil. James 1 and 13 said, Let no man say when he is tempted that he is tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and they are enticed. I think that's pretty clear that God does not tempt us with evil. But allows us to be tested. Jesus was tested, wasn't he? But who was he tested by? Did Satan not come to him? When he was in the wilderness? And begin to tempt him? Tempt. He tempted him. He would try to use the word while Jesus was in a weakened state. Christ didn't blink once hardly. Get behind me, Satan, for it is written. He knew what the word was. He was the word in living form. So we will be tempted 
tested, if you will. But God said this about being tested, that we will not be tested more than what? Then we are able to overcome. So we have a loving God in heaven who wishes us to build character. He loves for us to pray to him. He will allow for us to be tested to build our character so that when we are ready to depart from this place, that we'll also be ready to enter heaven. How can that be? But it is. We have a Father in heaven, a sovereign God. <clears throat> and in God, in his kingdom, his will is done. Isn't it? His desire is for us to take on his character. That's what his desire is. Take on the character of God. He made us in whose image? His image. He desires a relationship with us, even until the last days and beyond. So when we leave here and we trust in him daily and we've created his kingdom in our lives, right? When we've got an attitude of love, when we have an attitude of forgiveness, when we have the character of God built up in us, when we are kind and compassionate, when we have love for one another, forgiving each other as Christ forgave us, when we follow God's example, as he said, dearly loved children, walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us. We know that God doesn't tempt us with evil, but allows us to be tested. So what I would ask you today is when you think of the Father's prayer from now on, our Father, which art in heaven, consider that sovereign God in heaven who loved you so much that he gave his only begotten Son so that you might have relationship with him. So he might build his character in you. So that you might be fit to be with him in heaven. <coughs> that you honor his name. Here on earth now, in all that we say, in what we do. We don't want to dishonor God. That we allow his kingdom to be in place of our spirit man in our lives in our homes that we allow God to be here with us to dwell with us now here on earth that each and every day we look to God for our needs to be met and that we forgive others quickly and understand that we can't harbor unforgiveness in our lives it will destroy the river of our lives it will taint it it will scar our spirit man allow us to overcome the things that we're tempted with that we are trialed with because we recognize that until God's character is built up enough in us that we will not be fit to be in heaven with him. And that's what we're looking forward to. Is we want to be fit. To be in God's kingdom. Would you join me in a closing prayer. Lord I've gone over what you. Had called me to speak about today. And when I started to study. I didn't realize the depth. <coughs> of information that was available to us in your word. Sometimes it's difficult for us to put it all together. 
But God, as we honor you, you are quick to give us the understanding. And ask in our lives, Lord, each and every day, that you make your presence known, that you be the first thing that we think about in the mornings when we wake up, the last thing on our minds as we go to sleep, that we're honoring you in everything that we do, Lord, and that we build your character in our lives. And we'll give you the praise and glory for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.